certainly want to welcome anyone who will be watching on YouTube at whatever point, today or this week. I want to begin today a short series, but a series that we want to call Holy Sexuality. Holy Sexuality. I actually got this title off of a couple of books that I'm reading, and I will bring this out in the, in the coming weeks. Today, we want to begin a journey to try and understand how God has designed us as people in the world of our sexuality, this part of our nature. Now, <laughs> I need to take some time to to try and build a, an introduction to this. Today is all going to be about a foundation. Because we're talking about foundational things, we will be in Genesis for just those couple of verses. Uh, I won't have anyone to come up and read them because they are, I will be, we will be looking at those verses as, as we go through our, our sermon, our talk today. Now, I realize this topic, this subject, is highly political. I get it. This is also a very, very emotionally sensitive topic, and it's a difficult topic. It's difficult. However, our time together will be a biblical look at this topic. And for anyone listening on YouTube later, uh, we will, uh, this is a biblical uh, outlook. You could look at it from a cultural perspective, and we will talk about culture, but we won't be looking at it from a cultural perspective. We'll be looking at it from a biblical perspective. You could look at it from a scientific perspective, and we will be speaking a time or so about some science about it, but it won't be from a scientific perspective. It will be from a biblical perspective, but we will add these other things in. Now, my goal, and I need everyone here to listen as best you can, because it's very easy to hear bits and pieces and get upset, or someone listening, watching the video, to listen to bits and pieces selectively and be upset, and then start accusing Eric or RCBC of all kinds of things. And the only way to be honest about this is to be as attentive as possible. And certainly anyone watching, please be patient because my goal is not to upset anybody. However, I certainly realize that it's possible that people could be upset. It is filled with a lot of presumptions and assumptions, particularly from people outside the Christian circles. For example, there's a rumor in certain areas that Eric hates gay people. And this is the word that I was told. Okay? Eric didn't make these up. So this was told me from outside, that Eric hates gay people. Can I say right now, unequivocally, that Eric does not hate gay people? I do not. If I'm meant to be Christ-like, and am I meant to be Christ-like, by the way? I am meant to be. Are you meant to be Christ-like? As a believer, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. If we are meant to be Christ-like, then that means that the John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. And who's included in the world? Everybody. If I'm meant to be Christ-like, then that means that Eric needs to love the world and everyone in the world doesn't mean that I need to like everything about the, the world and the world system. Do you understand the difference? There is a difference. Several years ago, someone uh, helped themselves to a trailer that I had and never brought it back. And we call that word stolen. A year or so later, uh, it happened again. Now, I didn't like the fact that it happened. I didn't like the fact that someone did that, 
But I think I can honestly say that if I would met, have met that person, that I could still love them. And then another year later, believe it or not, you'd think I'd learn, it happened again. Then, not too long before COVID, we had a break-in. You remember that? It was before Bethany, we had a break-in. Window put through, laptop stolen, stuff all over the place. I'm still, believe it or not, every now and again, I'll, I'll see a piece of glass. Every now and again, I was still picking up glass from here, there, and around. It was upsetting. I didn't like that it happened, but I truly think, and I had to work through this in my own mind, that if I met the person in court, and that was a very definite possibility, if I met the person in court, I truly think, as if I would get an opportunity to make a statement, that I would say that I forgive this person, and I love that person, and I hope that they would be able to find Christ. Didn't like what they did, but I truly think I could say that I love that person. This subject is filled with complications, and here's a couple of the complications. Complication number one is that in June of 2021, the British uh, United Methodist Church, now this is not Eric making it up, this is, just, this is out there, you can find it anywhere on the, on the internet you want to. In June of 2021, the British United Methodist Church voted to uh, perform same-sex marriages in church. So there was a decision that this lifestyle is acceptable. Now, I'm not talking, again, from a social perspective. I'm saying from a biblical perspective, the message is that this is acceptable. This is acceptable behavior. February just gone, the Church of England Synod had voted to offer an in-church blessing to same-sex couples, which is a very small step away from offering an in-church wedding to same-sex couples. I can very much envision that happening within the next three to four to five years. Eric, are you angry with them? I, I've not, I would not take away their ability to make such decisions. However, if you were to ask me, Eric, of course you would agree with that because you're a church as well. My much higher calling is to follow God's Word and to be obedient to God's Word. With so much confusion, change, and varying opinions and emotions, the question is, what does the Bible say about this? And how can we understand it? And here's three broad responses to this. Response one could be this. I don't really care what the Bible says. I'm not bothered. And that's okay. We can sit down together and we can talk about why. I believe that the Bible has authority and another person may not believe that and we can sit down and talk together. I think I've been able to, over the 20 years we've been in Rosden, been able to sit down and talk to anybody about anything and that's okay. We can do that. But that's one possible response. I'm not bothered with what the Bible says. However, we can still talk about that. Number two, a response could be, you Christians, you need to move with the times. Society changes. Things change. But wait a minute. I do believe the Bible says that your word is settled in heaven forever, O Lord. The Bible is timeless. Okay? The Bible does not change with the times. We need to stand on God's word. That's why on your bulletin, the very first little line there, four points, the Bible is central to who we are. Number three, possible. Eric, I disagree with your understanding of what the Bible says. I believe what the Bible says, but I disagree with your understanding. That's fine. We can sit down together as well and talk about it. And I'm, and I'm fine with that. So particularly, please, 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 for anyone who may be uh, not understanding or have a, uh, uh, not agree with me here or anyone watching, please don't prejudge, prejudge me. Please don't prejudge me. 
We will need three to four weeks to try and work through all the various angles to do it proper justice. And I'm very happy with anybody to sit and work through this and talk about things as best we can. And it's possible that we may come to a point where we just can't see eye to eye. That's okay. That's okay. However, as I said, I am a Christian first and foremost. I am a heterosexual individual. I am not a psychologist. Neither am I God, who knows all and understands all. However, having been in Rosenton for 20 years, I do think I've done my best to try and speak the truth, speak the truth in love, but it's been always my desire to speak the truth. So today we are all about building a foundation, and for that we do need to go to the beginning in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to uh, read just two verses together, and then we're going to pull these apart and try to understand some of the foundations of what God had set up there in the very, very beginning. But first of all, we do want to uh, ask a couple of questions, a couple of questions, and these will be on your papers if you want to jot down those, 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 those couple of uh, uh, fill-in-the-blanks, that would be great. First of all, a couple of questions, and I think it's a fair question. And the question, first question is, why in the world we even, would we even talk about this to begin with? Uh, come on now. Uh, Chad, this is not talking to me. Yeah. Okay, so a couple questions. So why, why even talk about this? Why even talk about this? I mean, this is such a, a, a something that you, you church folks should be talking about Jesus and God and, and loving each other, and you should be maybe even singing songs and all that sort of stuff. But th this, is, this is a private subject. This is something that really has no place in the church. I think that's a, part of a, a, a problematic mindset. Okay. As this theme is a major biblical theme, I did uh, some, uh, some checking around. Now, I will say this is not my first hand, uh, my, my personal work doing this, but if you look on uh, some research that some rabbis have done, some Jewish, uh, Jewish leaders, they would say without, throughout the Old Testament, there are 613 laws. Now, they've gone through and counted them, and how they would, there was some controversy on how you would count them because sometimes they were repeated twice. Sometimes there's a sort of a mixture amongst. But if we can say roughly 600 laws throughout the Old Testament, uh, dealing with all kinds of aspects of Jewish life, work, worship, all those things, there are 24, 24 that deal with the subject of sex and pro prohibitions. And areas that we need to guard in this world of sex and sexuality. So why we talk about this? Because it's an important biblical theme. It's important to understand, for Christians to understand what the Bible says, especially in the light of our current social time. Then we can ask the question, why is God even bothered? Is that a fair question? Why is God bothered? I mean, why does God care what people do in the privacy of their own homes? Why should God care? And the answer I want to give you is this. God loves you. God designed you. And He wants the very best for you. Any, it's, a, it's a common thing. Anytime a bloke buys a piece of equipment... The first thing he does is throw away the manual, right? Men are not good at reading manuals. However, if I do get stuck, and often I do, the manual will be the first thing I try to find. Because sure enough, somewhere within that book or on that website now will be how to do that certain little bit. And because God designed us, He wants the very best for us, God knows how we work. 
And God knows what we need. And God knows how we need to guard against things. And the objection could be, are you trying to deny me who I really am? Now, we'll come to this more. But this is a comment and a phrase that I've heard any number of times. Well, my sexuality is who I really am at my core. I like to say that in all love, I would disagree with that. I would disagree with that. Now, we'll, 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 we'll get more to this later. But your identity is not your sexual attraction. Do you understand me? Do you hear me? Your identity is not your sexual attraction. And as I said, we will deal more with this at a later time. So let's now read Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, and we will take some time working through this. But if you'll just stay with me, we shall come away, hopefully, with a good foundation to get started on our understanding of this. Verses that we have looked at a number of times over the years, and for all those who are brand new here, uh, please bear with me. I try not to assume anything, so if I rush through something, please just kind of give me some wink or some kind of something to, to let me know we need to sort of put the brakes on and see if we could, you know, fill things out and, uh, and bring things a bit more fuller to you. But Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says, Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, uh, uh, the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, we have made a big deal about this in the past, and we need to continue to make a big deal at it because the Bible clearly says in verse 26, Chad, that we are created in God's image. Now, there have been books written about this, many sermons written about this, I am sure, many sermons given out about this. So we need to ask some really important questions. And the question is, what does this really mean? And I have three points that I want to give out to you, and those will be the words on your papers. And the first one is this. I want to sort of say what it doesn't mean. What it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we are just like God. Right? I made a comment earlier that I am not God. Now, I have to bring a shocking bit of news to you. Are you ready? Hold on to your seat. Neither are you God. Okay? Is that okay with you? Okay? Neither are you God. There is only one God, and He had the job long before you and I were around. Okay? He's not retired. He's not retired. There is no pension plan. God is God, and I am not God. So when it says that we, are, we were created in God's image, it doesn't mean that we are just like God with all the attributes of God, because that would mean that we would know all. Now, I realize we come across some people who pretend like they know it all, but that's not true, right? Could mean that, you know, that, that if you were God, that we were everywhere all at the same time and that we are from eternity past to eternity future. I mean, truth be told, God has a pretty good CV, okay? God's got a pretty good CV. And I don't think there's a single person here who could say that my CV is anything like God's. So what it doesn't mean is that we are just like God. However, what could it mean? What could it mean? Well, there are lots of guesses, lots of uh, sort of discussions about what it could mean. And we've been here before, but let's just bring out a couple of these things. There is, there's not an animal in the world who, would have an, who has an awareness of a higher power. We'll just use that term, higher power. Okay? For us, we understand it, that is the God of the Bible and all the things that go with it. A spiritual awareness of God at some level, and I think that's one of the things that it does mean. And what's interesting, if you go all around the world, no matter what culture you come across, 
there'll be something that people will recognize as God in some form, whether it's a, a, a stone object, whether it's an animal, whether it's an ancestor, people all around the world in every culture, and certainly every culture that I've seen, and I've been to, <laughs> that they would worship something. There is something that they venerate that they lift up as God. So I think that is one of the, the, the ways that, that, that we have shown ourselves as the image of God that we're able to relate to God. I've got a dog called Diesel. He's an interesting little animal. Now, he's not a little animal. Stands about that tall. I think he weighs about 500 kilos now with all the fur. Uh, he's getting to groom, by the way. What, two weeks, Lisa, something like that? Getting to groom. And Diesel's lovely 95% of the time, except when he's barking as he sits on my settee. And that bark hits the window, comes back, and just gives me a heart attack nearly every time it happens. Okay? But Diesel has a capacity to love. He'll come up. And when Bethany's there, especially if she's got something to eat, right? You have a dog? Anyone have a dog? You know what I'm talking about. Right? Bethany's got something to eat. He'll side up to her. He'll put his snout right on her knee. Give her the old big brown eyes. Bethany, I love you. Even more, I love what you got in your hand. Could you give me something? So I think animals do have some level of emotion, but I think that's one of the other things that as, as, as images of God, we have ability to have far more complex emotions. Okay? Now, don't get upset with me. But I think especially women can have complex emotions. And for all of us poor blokes, I know, you can get angry at me later, you can throw tomatoes and all sorts of things. Okay? And boy, it can be such a complex thing. And, and blokes can be that way too, right? Yeah. Trying, you know, trying to figure this person out, trying to figure that person out, and, and how does it work, and, and, and what's going on, and, and all, all those kind of stuff. But I think we are complex emotional people. And I think in that way, God, we are, we are images of God in that way, because God, look, if you look throughout the Scriptures and see all the different emotions that Jesus exhibited and, and the, the emotions that are attributed to God, wow, that's huge. And I think that's one of the ways that we are created in God's image. And then there's this ability to create. We talked about this before, how that people, we are creative people. Look at the artwork that people can do, the, the things that people can come up with. Various things like that. And there's all, there could be other things. There could be other things. And there's and like I said, the various opinions about what it means to be created in God's image. But we do know what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we are just like God. And what it could mean is some of these things that we mentioned. However, Here's what it definitely means. It means that we are created with purpose and value. That each person here has purpose. And so the word is we, what it definitely means. What it definitely means. What it definitely means. That God created us with purpose and value. Now, and we've, we've been down this road for any number of people. Often what happens is that people will get low and get to have depression, get, get, get really in a state. And, um, and we forget that God created us with purpose. So if you're, you're sat here, you have a purpose. Okay? You are not here by accident on this earth. You have design. You have value. You have value. And by the way, that's one of the big arguments, in my view anyway, how that God created us, and all this isn't just by happen chance, by some big bang at some point in distant past history. Because if I'm nothing more than just a biological machine, is there anything that really says I have value? No. I'm just some biological blob stood on the floor right now. But if I am a person created by God in God's image, that means that I have purpose and I have value. What a great thing that is. That's not a crutch, by the way, to make me feel better. Now, I've been told this any number of times in the past. 
you Christians, you know, you've got this belief that it's all a crutch to make yourself feel better and die to die. I've had that many times. Okay. But it's true. As a person, you have value and you have purpose. The problem is this. As in the garden when Adam and Eve took of that fruit and ate of that fruit, then what happened is, is that every part of us, and Chad looked at this some weeks ago, every part of us became broken. Every part of us became, I'm going to use the word skewed. I kind of like it, skewed. Sounds cool, skewed. And that means if we are going down this direction, Every part of us has gone off to the side some. Some of us may be even greater than others, but all of us, all of us have been skewed because of this sin issue started all the way back in the Garden of Eden, passed along to, your, to, to Cain and Abel, passed along to their children, and so forth and so forth, and down to your parents and down to me. So what has that got to do with our sexuality? Well, God designed it, and then we're going to look at this uh, uh, next week when we think about marriage and the first couple, that God designed for Adam and Eve to come together as a, as, as, as a couple for uh, their entire lifetime, and that was God's ideal design. However, because of being skewed, now we have all the problems that we have today. Problem of pornography which is a skewed, right? That's why we are drawn to that, because of the sin. That's a problem. That's why we have a problem of adultery as a skewed part. We have a problem of one-night stands. We have the problem of incest. We have the problem of living together without being married. Whoa, hold on, Eric. Now, it is 2023. What are you on about? Okay. Okay. I, I will. And, here, and here's the thing. People will say, well, you're on about this thing of homosexuality being askewed. And da, da, da. But wait a minute. What about, what about you lot who are, who, are, who are living together, but you're not married? You don't say anything about that. Well, I'm saying it about right now. Okay. That is as equally as sinful as the other. We don't like to hear that because it's such a normal thing now. We've taken something that God has designed and we've, we, 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 we've skewed it because of the sin and we've skewed it. Now it's become normal. It's become normal. And what happens after something becomes normal for so many years? It's just a part of accepted life, right? Right? And we don't see anything wrong with it. But wait a minute. Does God still have a design, an, I- an ideal for relationships? He does. Does God still have an ideal for our sexuality? He does. He does. Eric, are you angry? No, I'm not angry. I love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't say this. I really wouldn't. I was at an assembly this last week, and uh, I was challenged by somebody, which doesn't often happen, but happens every now and again. I was challenged by someone. We were talking about, we were talking about how the, that um, uh, using the story of uh, Cain and Abel, and and remember, you know, Cain rose up and killed Abel, and God came down. Uh, Where's your brother Abel? Remember what Cain said. Well, that, before that, you know what he said? Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how you spell it. Mm-hmm. Huh. Am I my brother's keeper? The point is, do I have any responsibility to my brother? And as I came to this, there was a, a young lad that piped up and shouted out, No! I said, no, okay. He said, so you don't, you don't care about anybody or anything other than yourself? No. I said, okay. I said, well, I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I care about you. I, I love you. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Assembly. I wouldn't be here because it, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to put this together. So I care about you. Interesting. Hopefully, give him something to think about. 
So the reason I say these things, and I realize that the misunderstanding that could come across from this is that um, there's such a, it has become such a norm for us to sort of think in this way that, you know, that living together without being married is a norm, that the one-night stand thing, we, we joke about it and all that kind of stuff. And all these things are described as sin, but homosexuality is included within that category as well. So we are clearly made in God's image, but the problem is, the fundamental, the basic problem is that we are all broken. Every part of us is broken. Our sexuality is broken as well, and that's why we struggle. But then let's come now to the second verse, verse 27. Verse 27. We want to look at, in verse 27, I'm going to call the unfolding of God's highest creation. The unfolding of God's highest creation. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him male and female. He created them. <clears throat> now, just two points, just two points, and I need you to listen really, really carefully. Number one, in the beginning part, there's a repeat of the creation statement. There was a repeat. Notice what it says. It says, so God created man in his own image. Now, <clears throat> there is that statement there that is actually a repeat from verse 26. But there's something interesting. Let's go back up to verse 26. I didn't mention this before because I wanted to tie this in here. Then God said, verse 26, let us make man in our own image, men, according to our likeness, let them, let them, well, that's weird. Why does it say them? You would, now, if I was writing this in my English class a thousand years ago, my teacher would have, whack, whack, right? Because I mixed up things. Let us make man in our image. Man is a singular or plural? Which one? It is singular. Let them have dominion. Well, that's weird. Should say him. Should say him. But it does say them. So here's the, here's the idea. Here's the idea. That there's a word there, and all of the and to say now we can we can say uh, we can say the word man. To mean everyone, and we we could use it that way, but a I think a, a great way to translate that would be humankind, humankind. So let's change that out. Let us make humankind in our image. So that would include both man and woman, Adam and Eve. So that's the general statement that God gives in verse twenty six. In verse 27, he actually takes that word that's translated for humankind and adds a special little bit onto that word that refers back to verse 26. So he's basically saying this thing in verse 27, whatever it is, this humankind thing, it's the same thing that I'm talking about in verse 26. So he's tying together 26 and 27. But then he says this. He says this. In verse 27, we're going to finish with this. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Now God takes this overarching structure of humankind and says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a male and I'm going to create a female. Now, there's, uh, so this is God's plan. This is God's plan that he provides. There was a clergy person who not too long ago said, aha, uh -huh, no, we got a problem here. The word doesn't really mean male and female or man and woman. It means maleness and femaleness. And the idea is that, that they, there's no real line or there's no real clear category, but they can, it can be sort of mooshed together. And so male can become female, female can become male. There's no real clear lines. And this was the argument. Now, there's no proof given, but say, aha, it says female. Now, what's interesting is I looked fairly heavily about this word 
that is used for male and female. It's used many times throughout the Old Testament, but in every time it is used to show a male person and without, without respect to age, it could be a male baby, it could be a male adult, it could be a male animal. But it's always a very clear category of male. None of this maleness stuff. It's not there. But then he says he created them as female. And it's the exact same scenario that it is definitely a female... It could be a, 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 woman, a, a female baby, it could be a female adult, it could be a female animal, but it's definitely a female. Very, very clearly. So what's the point, Eric? What are you trying to say? It's very clear to me from a scriptural perspective. And I'm not angry, I'm not angry. I want us to understand. I want us to be able to be, able to be a blessing to people, I want us to, as, as, we go through our, uh, as we go through this study, as we go through this series, be able to understand God's design for us. But it goes all the way back to the beginning that God created us, male and female. However, the problem is we are skewed. That's why there is the issue of pornography. That's why there, there's the issue of adultery. That's why there is the issue of living together. That's why there is the issue of homosexuality. And I'm not pulling out the homosexuality as some special category. It's all along the same lines there. That God created us for the two genders, male and female, in His image. I find it interesting. I came across an interview with Pierce Morgan and Richard Dawkins. Who's Richard Dawkins? He is the biologist who would say, you Christians are a bunch of nutters for believing or even thinking that there is some God who created all this stuff. Now, I find it interesting that in this interview, Richard Dawkins actually says, he quotes, as a biologist, there are two sexes, and that's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. So even Richard Dawkins, <laughs> who would not agree with anything in the Genesis account of creation, would say, listen, it's clear. There are two sexes, male and female. Now, I realize we've got a whole lot of stuff yet to cover, but we've got to set down the foundation first. We've got to set down the foundation. So I'm going to ask you to be patient with me. For anyone who's watching, I'm going to ask you to be patient with me. And together, in love, let's speak together. Let's speak the truth. Let's speak the truth in love.